Delighted to um, have as our next guest, Richard, would you come up? Um, Richard Worgan is the Executive Vice President and Global Head of Brand uh, Communications and Digital for Philips. Richard has joined us as a special summit um, guest. Um, you've only got to look, and I invite you to look at it, at um, Richard's biography to appreciate um, we have with us today, and we're lucky, thank you for coming, um, a serious, outstanding global brand strategist. Welcome to the summit. Thank you very much. So firstly, good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be here for the next 20 minutes or so to share with you some of my sort of personal experience on measurement and building brands in what is a very disruptive and dynamic marketplace. We're familiar with the always-on revolution, um, the way that consumers, customers, and clients are permanently connected. And this provides a new opportunity for brand dialogue, for data, and for analysis. And this always-on revolution has changed the way marketing and measurement needs to be done forever. This is the next picture, is a picture that was taken in London last week, two pictures. The new working, we're familiar with how everyone is changing, everyone is connected permanently. When I took up my first role in marketing back in the mid-1990s, I'm not sure that I've said, if I'd have been doing this, that I'd have thought that I was at work. It's a very different environment that we're in. Everyone is connected, whether it be at a bus stop or a train station. There is no downtime. And this provides huge opportunities for us as marketeers and as brand specialists. Again, whether we're in cafes, whether we're in uh, hotel lobbies or airport lounges, we're always connected. There is a new paradigm, a new way of working. Similarly, there's a new way of working. There's most certainly, I'm sure you'll be familiar with it, there's a new way of playing. A new way of, back one please, a new way of playing. Um, we used to go and, you know, our children used to go and play across the street or around the corner you know, with, with friends that they knew. Now, they're playing on tablets, in, uh, in, in chat rooms, in a much more connected way, with potentially friends who they don't know, may never have met, in a different environment, in a different, uh, uh, in a different, uh, in a different country or a different time zone. And this is a very different and new way of communicating. There's also the new way of talking. I think you'll all be familiar when you've got your sisters or your uh, children sitting down on the sofa. Um, we have that new way of talking. It's a conversation which is inaudible. Um, these were three girls who were uh, round at my, uh, my friend's house, and they were all in one conversation. But the conversation they were having was about the conversations and the dialogues they were having with brands and with friends in different social media on different platforms. So it's a conversation now about a conversation. And we need to understand how we can engage in that if we're going to really understand how to build brands in this very new environment. And of course, there's the new shopping. This was a picture that was taken by one of our researchers. And this individual is sitting in a coffee shop, having a nice relaxing coffee, researching the purchase that he's about to make in the store opposite him. It's a very different way of engaging. And it's a very different way that we need as marketers and as brands to understand how we can engage and how we can get our brand attributes and get our brand in front of consumers. So we do live in a very disruptive time. And this changing environment may seem, uh, several years ago, something which was more sci-fi, but it is a reality. In some recent research done by the Savvy Marketing Group, it suggests that 64% of shoppers would like to receive targeted coupons on their smartphones while they're shopping in a store. Research from Digital Deloitte suggests that for every dollar spent, 36 cents of that dollar has had a digital interaction associated with it. And that's due to increase to 50% by the end of this year. And in other additional research in the UK, Respondents said that they had used their mobile phone to compare prices, to look at product reviews whilst in the shopping experience, whilst in store. 
and that's up to 43% from only 19% in 2011. So things are changing very rapidly. And in this digital world that we now live in, we know that it's changing, uh, the consumer orientation is changing, but so too are the propositions, so too are the products and the services that are being offered. And that provides great opportunities for the entrepreneurial side of bigger organizations, or for startups, or for established branded players. On this slide, you can see some of those different propositions, whether it be Uber providing immediate access to car services and, limited, and limos by leveraging new technology and geolocation-based capability on, on smartphones. Or whether it be the tweet shop, which is actually using social media and using your tweets and your social uh, platforms to pay for different products and services. So if you can actually now buy products and services by using your social currency and leveraging your own social network. And then here in Amsterdam, one of the most recent uh, new ventures is the ability to lease jeans. So if you join up to this organization, you can effectively lease jeans so you've permanently got the latest pair of jeans on. They'll deliver them to your house and they'll keep sending you new pairs so you have instant access to the immediate fashion and trends in, uh, in jean wear. So it's a very different, and these are providing opportunities which really are quite incomprehensible sometimes and may not be on our next uh, to-do list from a business strategy perspective. And at Philips as well, as an established brand player, we've got to learn to try and build out these digital propositions and leverage this new capability and these new dynamics. So even when it comes to some of our more traditional products and services, whether it be our, our uh, home cooker, this is now a home cooker device which is connected wirelessly to the internet, which allows you to download recipes, undertake uh, remote access. You can even start this thing from remotely so that your food is ready when you get back in through apps on your, on your smartphone. So everything is now evolving in this digital space. When it comes to the, uh, to the uh, air purification, we have a new product which we've just launched in China, uh, an air purifier. And this, again, is something which is linked digitally for connected devices. It put, it on, put the app on your smartphone. You can monitor remotely the quality of the air in your apartment. So if the quality of the air isn't particularly good, you can actually go and into your app on your smartphone. You can monitor it. You can get the thing up and running in the apartment while you're away. So when you come back with your family in the evening, you can be conscious and confident of the quality of the air that you're breathing. So all of these things now are connected. We're looking at ways to leverage this change in the products that companies such as Philips put out there and all the, in the way that we need to compete with very different customers in a very different environment. So how do we build brands in such a disruptive marketplace? Well, in my mind, I think a lot of the principles remain the same. Um, we know that strong brands build preference. And this is critical in today's environment as where it has been for the last 10 or 15 years. If we look at how Apple can drive that desire and the cues for whenever they launch a product, that's true brand preference. We know that brands and strong brands command a premium. Uh, if we look at the way that Starbucks continues to sell, along with its competitors, a cups of coffee at two or three times the price of just a normal cup of coffee. And of course, brands like IBM, which show that big, strong brands really can drive loyalty. So strong brands really need to do all of these things well. And it's as true today as it has been. But what makes a brand strong? And this is something which is important, and we've been working on most recently in the last 12, 18 months at Philips, which is to build a strong brand, you do need to be increasingly focused on ensuring that we understand the one ownable idea, the thing that makes you different from someone else. And today, with the multitude of different channels that we have, it's increasingly important to make sure that we do organize ourselves, and as a brand, organize ourselves around a brand promise and a principle. That is what can make you strong and consistent in the market. And if we look at a few of these on the slide, we're familiar with American Express, 
who unifies its communications around and its messaging around synchronizing the world of commerce, whether it be the more traditional uh, uh, around Lego and traditional toys around constructive play. So these are just ideas. These are very pertinent brand promises which organize our messaging to make sure that we can be consistent in the marketplace. And during the last 12 months, we too at Philips have had to, even as a big, strong global brand, start to ensure that we can really articulate the very nature of what makes Philips Philips. What is the Philipsness? We have an idea, and you'll all have an idea in your heads as to what Philips is about, but we have a very broad portfolio of products and services that are bought and enjoyed by a very broad set of audiences. So how can we actually unify what we do under one common thought? We're a diversified technology company with over 40 businesses across healthcare, lighting, and personal well-being, or lifestyle. And so we needed to try and create a brand promise that would capture this. We see the growing need for healthcare, a growing need for looking after the elderly, and that population is increasing, which is putting its own pressures on governments and on authorities to start rethinking the way that healthcare is delivered to make sure that it can be increasingly delivered in a cost-effective and manageable way. We see an increased need in personal well-being. Interestingly, only 62% of the population believe that um, they have a good or very good state of well-being or health. And I think in this, in today and in this year, I'd expect that to be higher. There's still more work that we can do. And we see a great deal more of individuals wanting to start to take personal control over their well-being and over their own health care, which is really important in the way that products and propositions start to be delivered through health care and through into lifestyle and into the home as well. We also see a rise in the demand for energy efficient solutions. Um, we know that an awful lot of the world's energy is used up in lighting, just under 20% of the world's energy is used up in lighting. And we know that by deploying energy efficient uh, and lighting efficient solutions, we can reduce that cost and that burden globally by about 40%. So there are a very broad set of capabilities that we have at Philips that we need to try, needed to try and find a common unifying thought for. So the answer really lies in trying to determine something that is universally true, that is believable, uh, unifying for an organization, but also differentiated. And in the last 12 months, we've tried to articulate that. And we believe that at Philips, the point of difference is around the combination of innovation and people, ensuring that innovation isn't driven for innovation's sake. We've heard uh, a lot this morning around understanding the audience. This is absolutely about understanding the consumer and making sure that we deliver innovation that is meaningful and improving the lives of individuals. And at Philips, we don't look at this from trying to solve the world's problems through innovation. We look at it through the lens of trying to bring innovation to the marketplace that will improve the lives of you, the individual. And that will then have a scale which can increase. But we try to stay well clear of platitudinal promises to make the world a better place. We believe that we can do that, but it's through meaningful innovation that really is, ma is meaningful to individuals. And in order to try and re-articulate that promise and try and provide greater focus for the Philips organization moving forward, we could go back to some of our history and some of our heritage. We did bring communications to the masses uh, through radios. We had our own radio stations uh, and later through TVs. This was innovation that did matter to people. We used our expertise in vacuum tubes to start to make x-ray, to make the invisible visible. And this provided medical services and solutions, which, again, was very meaningful to people. And today, when we look at different lighting solutions, we're not just providing bulbs to light domestic uh, residences, 
but we're providing lighting solutions which can provide entire architectural lighting solutions which don't just provide a nice to look at for a tourist, but actually start to change the dynamics of different communities, building prosperity, building tourism in different areas, whether it be around the pyramids in Egypt or whether it be Da Nang Bridge here in Vietnam. So we also, we also provide new technology solutions around x-rays. So we have minimally invasive surgery, which is meaningful to the hospital because you can get quicker access through, you get more patients quicker through the hospital and you get much better recoveries because there hasn't been a knife or a blade involved in the operation. So these are meaningful, very meaningful innovations. We continue to light up the world through monuments, but we also light up events, and we start to build out lighting technology which enhances the uh, event experience. And in a small little championship or cup which is going to be competed for down in South America in the coming weeks, we're lighting up nine of those 12 stadiums with very innovative, innovative lighting solutions that really will start to benefit the people going to those games. And it's not just about lighting up sporting icons, there's also the musical icons and trying to use our technology in more innovative ways, whether it be for the costumes using LED technology for the black eyed peas. So with these varied and diverse propositions, it's important that we start to rally around a more concise view and a more concise brand promise, which is why we've landed in the space of saying that at Philips we deliver meaningful innovation that really matters to people, that really matters to you as an individual. So we've started to now unify much of our communications behind our new brand line, Innovation and You, leveraging some of the iconic nature of our shield in so doing. So this is really where we need to start to up the game. Because as we start to understand what we need to drive brand, we need to understand how we can measure all elements of the brand to make sure that we're aligning a very diverse business behind that brand promise. So it's around local measurement. It's ensuring that we can measure the brand, measure how we're doing against that brand promise, not just in global research, but at a very detailed level. So at Philips, we measure brand strength across 10 different attributes around authenticity, clarity, commitment, protection, responsiveness, consistency, differentiation, relevance, and presence. And these 10 attributes or 10 components, we take very ser seriously as making up how we can sort of take apart the brand and how we can really understand where the brand is strong and potentially where the brand needs some work. So we measure them constantly for Philips at both a local basis and on a global basis, which means that we can start to look at different aspects of our brand strength. We can see where we are differentiated well as a brand in a category. We can see where we're very relevant. We can also see where maybe on clarity, which is an internal measure around employee engagement and employee understanding, where we need to maybe dial things up so we can start to have a more rounded approach to our communications so that we can start to address very specifically the, the weaknesses or leverage very specifically, specifically the strengths of the brand. And through the work that we do, it also allows us to have some comparative benchmarks as well so that we can start to look at how we do versus competition or how we do versus a bag of other brands. So we can measure this at a local level and we can measure it at a global level, but that still doesn't give us quite the level of granularity that we need if we're really going to start building out differentiated marketing plans. So in order to prioritize investment, we start to look at this at a very granular level of detail by category. So we can see by category, and this is illustrative, da illustrative data, we can start to see how well our brand is performing in different categories that the Philips brand is competing in. For example, what, how do we, do we fully understand across those 10 components what the drivers of the brand are in kitchen appliances in Germany? And as you can imagine, this level of detail is immensely valuable. 
because as we could then go to build on and determine what our overall brand objectives are, both at a global level, then at a local level, and then at a market level, we can start to ensure that we're building out marketing programs and building out objectives that will support and build brand value against those 10 different components. Again, which is highly measurable. We can see how our programs are driving the brand value and the brand strength across those measures. If it starts to work, we can then repeat it. We can refine it. But we can measure it to ensure that we are delivering against those objectives and building our brand overall. And in this way, uh, we can pilot this approach uh, across our markets, and we can determine global brand goals, and then we can deliver very strategic, very targeted marketing plans at a local level that we can see and can measure and see how that is building our overall value. So measurement is key to brand building. Um, and today, I think you need to get to a level of granularity, uh, to a greater level of granularity than we have in the past because of the significant changes in the way that consumers are, are reacting and because of the way that digital is driving these connected products and devices. I mean, at Philips, we've been an advocate of measurement um, across the board, um, but it's important that we start to build up not just separate measurement models around PR, around communications, but a more holistic view of, of brand and communications. So we are developing uh, and delivering at the moment a more integrated, more holistic approach to measurement, which looks at how we can build uh, a dashboard that that takes into account our business goals, our business measures, our business impact, and combines that with the brand measurement that we do. So we can really start to see how the brand is contributing towards our business strategy. So in summary, I think that brand building uh, in a disruptive marketplace is a challenge. I think there are still some principles around a unifying around a brand idea, which is believable, um, and motivating and differentiated for consumers is important. But the amount of detail that you now need in order to build strategic brand building plans, I think is more challenging than it ever has been. Being consistent is critical, but being measured is even more important. We need to be consistent by message. We need to be consistent by proposition. And we need to increasingly, across this diverse range of media, be consistent in identity. All of that leveraging and building off one brand idea. Brand measures need to build, or need to be based on local insights so that they can be constructive and so that they can actually leverage and be built from the consumer up, not from a global brand out. With that, I'd like to thank you very much and look forward to receiving some questions. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Richard's changed his um, diary today to be with us. I know he has a board meeting this afternoon, so thank you for doing that. Pleasure. Um, who would, um, who's got the first question? Uh, Thomas Stokler from uh, WCG. Richard, when you, uh, when you talk about unifying thoughts and uh, themes that are universally true, um, it, I understand this to be, from, a, you know, from my own perspective, as a very sort of Western perspective. You know, that's, that's, that's what, that's what we, we understand um, you know, with regard to Philips being a very traditional brand and so on. How about, um, how about the application of those truths in markets such as India, China, where I think we're seeing very, very different dynamics in social media and, and therefore... Yeah very different needs to, to communicate those universal truths yep. and different applications as well. It's, it's a great question um, and, and totally true. Um, Philips is a global brand. Uh, we have a unifying thought. That unifying thought needs to be translated effectively by market. So if we say that at Philips we are about delivering meaningful innovation that matters to you, you need to get under the skin of that in India. And in India, it is actually more about the innovation. Um, it is less about the you. 
So what we do is we have messaging workshops in each market that looks to try to really take apart that unifying thought so that it can be delivered in a consistent and appropriate way for that local market. Um, I'm a firm believer that whilst you have those global propositions or that unifying thought, it absolutely needs to be delivered through marketing programs which have local relevance. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've, had the, I've been lucky enough to work on several major global brands in my time. And I think what is special about Philips is that it, its proposition is local. So you've absolutely got to make sure that you are making all of the different marketing materials and messaging relevant to that specific audience in that specific country. Thank you. Um, can we come down here, please? So you are the global head of brand and communications. You have marketing and PR reporting up into you. So where is PR in terms of setting this strategy that you've talking about? You know, who is owning that in your organization? Um, well, in terms of it being owned, it ultimately works within the brand uh, and marketing arena. Um, I think that, interestingly, I think that the communications part of the business has been instrumental in setting the strategy. I think that some of the measurement that we have been doing historically through our more traditional PR approach has started to lay a foundation for moving to a new dimension. We're lucky enough to have uh, a wealth of data when it comes to brand, um, which historically, dare I say it, has probably sat in pivot tables, um, rather than truly leveraged and used to drive strategic marketing. So really, I take it upon myself to make sure we're pulling those together and using them as one consistent view to the marketplace, as opposed to more independent PR or communications plan, a brand advertising plan, a marketing activation plan. What we're doing is ensuring that those are all conceived together, brought together under one dashboard and one set of measurement um, so that we can have much more integrated campaigns and programs in the market. Uh -huh. How does it change the teams we put together? Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. It changes it a lot. I mean, we're moving to a more classic publishing model. Uh, away from you know, a communication structure which is around internal comms and external comms into one which is around content ownership, curation, and then engagement, two-way communication. So it's around setting those themes, making sure that what is important to Philips, we have got a rich content around innovation and around that application at a local mm -hmm. level, and then look at how we can distribute that and curate it based on whether it be through social, whether it's through more traditional media or through marketing programs. So it changes the way we organize ourselves quite a lot so that we can fully embed that approach and make sure we're organized in an efficient way because we need to make sure that that content isn't recreated. And I think like many organizations, we're looking at it and saying, okay, that content can reside in many places, but that's duplication and inconsistent. So how can we pull that together? Social is embedded. So... Again, you know, I've seen it in many different organizations, the way that social is organized, it's come up through digital, and then it's not quite sure what to do with it. Um, we've embedded that within our communications team and look at leveraging digital experts across the content areas as opposed to having these social media people sit in a little corner. Richard, I'm, I'm going to reluctantly have to um, close there. Um, our thanks on behalf of the audience for Pleasure. changing your Thank opinion. you very much.